Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for being here. September is Suicide Prevention Month, so we thought it would be a good time to talk about some of the mental health work we're doing and the tools available to Vermonters who need them. Although mental health has always been an important part of our overall health and well-being, the last few years have made that connection even more clear. Over the last 16 months, we've seen more than our share of devastation with intense storms hitting Vermont, some sweeping away homes and flooding our downtowns, which can take a toll on all of us. Whether it's something you've struggled with personally or you know someone who's, who has, mental health impacts all of us and is something we've got to stay focused on. <clears throat> and we've made some progress over the last few years to help those in need by adding more tools to the toolbox and making them available across the state. We've been able to implement things like our mobile crisis response, mental health urgent care centers, and the Vermont Child Psychiatry Access Program, which just reached an impressive milestone. Commissioner Haas will talk into, about this in more detail in a minute. We're also joined today by Reed Wabi, a military veteran who founded the Employee Wellness Partnership in Vermont to raise awareness about mental health and suicide prevention and provide trainings across the state. And finally, I want to thank Dr. Davis for making the trip here today from Rutland to talk about what she's seeing in our emergency rooms, how the tools we've implemented are working, and what we can do to expand access to unserved areas. It takes all of us working together across sectors to make a real difference in our communities. Whether it's checking in on your neighbor or volunteering in your community, you never know how much an act of kindness, no matter how small, can mean to others. Before I turn it over to Commissioner Haas, I also want to take a moment to thank Noah Kahn, who grew up in Stratford, for doing his part to give back to Vermont. For those who don't know, Noah is a singer and songwriter who will be at the Champlain Valley Exposition tomorrow night with all the money raised going directly to mental health organizations here in Vermont. So I'll be issuing a proclamation tomorrow to recognize Noah and his work through the Busy Head Project, which is the nonprofit he created to increase awareness, provide resources to those in need, and help eliminate the stigma around mental health. With that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Hawks. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Emily Hawes, Commissioner for the Department of Mental Health. Thank you for joining us today, whether you're here in person or tuning in online. September is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, and this is a time to focus on our suicide prevention efforts. But I want to speak with you today about the support that's available for Vermonters year round and the amazing progress being made in our communities. We know that life's challenges show up in different ways for all of us. <clears throat> Some may feel worried and overwhelmed. Others might lose interest in things they once enjoyed or struggle to keep up with work or daily life. However mental health struggles show up in your life, I want you to know this, you are not alone. There are resources ready to support you, not just during emergencies, but whenever you need them. As the Department of Mental Health, we are committed to building and improving a system where help is always within reach. And for us, that means having someone to call, someone to respond, and a safe place to go. It also means having a clear plan for moving forward with suicide prevention in Vermont. A plan that keeps us on track and accountable and helps everyone, individuals, communities, and providers know exactly how they can get involved. Let's start with someone to call. In Vermont, our someone to call is the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. The lifeline is for everyone. It's free, it's anonymous, and it's available to you no matter what challenges you're having. 
You don't have to be in a crisis or thinking about suicide to reach out. We've heard from call responders that folks call about feeling stressed at work, having relationship struggles, or just dealing with overwhelming emotions. Whatever it is, don't hesitate to call or text 988. You do not need to deal with your struggles alone. And for our pediatric primary care providers who are working with young patients, there's also someone to call. The Vermont Child Psychiatry Access Program, or Vermont CPAP. We announced yesterday that the Vermont CPAP just reached a big milestone. We announced that they took their 1,000th call. If you're a provider needing guidance on mental health for kids and teens, Vermont CPAP is here to help. It's a free phone line that connects you directly with licensed clinical social workers and child and adolescent psychiatrists who can support and advise you. While all pediatric practices in Vermont are enrolled in the Vermont CPAP, not everyone is actively using the service. If you haven't reached out, now is the perfect time. This resource is designed to make your job easier and provide better support for young patients. Providers can call the Vermont CPAP at 802-488-5342 for help whenever you need it. Now let's talk about someone to respond. Our someone to respond is our statewide mobile crisis response. Mobile crisis response teams come directly to you, whether you're at home, school, or somewhere else in the community. What's important here is that it's your crisis, however you define it. By showing up where and when people need help, we're able to offer immediate support and often avoid hospitalizations or police involvement. If you or someone you know needs mobile crisis support, call or text 988 and ask to be connected to a local mobile crisis response team or visit the gethelpvt.org for more information. Next, let's talk about having a safe place to go. In Vermont, that means our growing network of mental health urgent care programs. These programs offer a warm, welcoming environment where you can receive peer support, crisis de-escalation, and psychiatric care, all without the added stress of going to an emergency room. By providing walk-in care in the community, we take pressure off of the emergency departments and make it easier for you to receive help close to home. We already have several programs up and running across the state with more on the way. So right now we're up and running with Bennington, Wyndham, Northeast Kingdom, Washington County, and Addison County. This capacity will be expanded as the Chittenden County Mental Health Urgent Care opens its doors in Burlington at the end of October. You can call your local community mental health agency to find out where the nearest mental health urgent care is located. For our future, let's talk about our first ever suicide prevention strategic plan. We've crafted this plan with input from people like you, community members, organizations, people impacted by suicide, and those with lived experience. Because we want to truly reflect what Vermont needs to prevent suicide and support mental health. A strategic plan is more than just a document. It's our promise to be open and accountable. We want you to see our priorities clearly and know that your feedback has helped shape them. The plan focuses on three main strategies. Training the best practices for everyone, whether you're a community member, part of an organization, or a healthcare provider. Gathering and using data to make sure we're on the right track and can make necessary changes along the way. And then advocating for each Vermonter to have the support necessary to thrive. By coming together and committing to this plan, we can create safer, healthier communities. Every one of us plays a part in preventing suicide, whether you're a neighbor, a local organization, or working in healthcare, your involvement matters. I encourage you to get involved, read the plan, 
join Vermont Suicide Prevention Coalition meetings, visit facingsuicidevt.com for more information, and check in on those around you. Talking about mental health and suicide prevention can sometimes feel overwhelming. It can be hard to tell if our efforts are really making a difference. While we're focused on constantly improving, it can be tough to recognize and celebrate the progress we're already making. So today I want to assure you that our efforts are making a difference. The 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is working. 95% of the calls are resolved right over the phone. And the other 5% are diverted to mobile crisis response or an emergency department if that's indicated. And our average speed to answer rate is down to two seconds. Our mobile crisis teams are also making an impact with about 84% of those they help stabilize without needing to go to the hospital. And we're expanding our mental health urgent care programs to bring support closer to home. Most importantly, we're seeing a significant drop in suicide-related emergency visits this year. This shows that our strategies are saving lives and making a real impact. It also proves that talking openly about mental health and starting the conversation is working. So let's celebrate these successes and keep moving forward because the work isn't done and your involvement and dedication matter. Check in on others and check in with yourself. Together we can continue to build a safer and healthier community. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, my name is Allison Davis. I'm the medical director of the emergency department in Rutland. In RED, we work closely with the crisis clinicians from Rutland Mental Health. These are incredibly compassionate and skilled people who are available to our community 24 hours a day, seven days a week. After peaking in 2022, and during the time the mobile crisis program has been active, visits to the Rutland Emergency Department for suicidal ideation have dropped for children and adolescents. This year, our adult visits also appear to be trending in that same direction. The mobile crisis program allows clinicians to assess patients and families in the community, away from the noise and stress of the emergency department. The robust support the program offers also helps patients uh, leave the emergency department and receive treatment in the outpatient setting. Suicide prevention is a goal we place front and center in our emergency department. We screen every patient over the age of 12 for risk of suicide. And we are prepared to support patients struggling with suicidal thoughts, even if they came to the emergency department for another reason. But we recognize that the ED can be a scary place. And whenever a patient can be cared for in the community, it allows our nurses and providers to be present for other patients who also need our services. The mobile crisis program has a ripple effect, and it helps shorten wait times and visits in the whole emergency department. The hard work of the mobile crisis team in our community is an essential piece of high quality health care, and it's one that I hope will continue to have statewide support. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'd like to start really quickly with a Christine Kane quote that I think is very powerful. Oh, oh, oh my goodness. I'm blowing it already. It right. Oh, no. It's just WC, oh, not my to worry. Oh, gosh. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Perfect. 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 It took a lot of stress off of me there, so I'll move, do that moving forward. All right. So, this Christine Kane quote. Sometimes, when you're in a dark place, it can feel like you've been buried, when actually, you've been planted. My name's Reed Wabi, and I'm the founder of the Employee Wellness Partnership here in Vermont. 
The Employee Wellness Partnership started about 18 months ago with a simple goal in mind, actively care for people by combating the diseases of despair. The diseases of despair is a term used to describe the conditions of alcohol use disorder, substance use disorder, isolation, and suicide. To accomplish this goal, first we cultivated a relationship with the, de with the Department of Health and aimed to provide suicide and overdose prevention training and resources to individuals, companies, and organizations across the, across the state. Since making that first alliance, the partnership has grown to include the Associated General Contractors of Vermont, Genis Promise, the Vermont Chamber of Commerce, the Vermont Ski Area Association, Invest EAP, and Sauna at Stowe. Over the last 18 months, we've been able to provide countless resources in both overdose prevention and suicide prevention to more than 100,000 Vermonters, including nearly 20,000 doses of Narcan and 15,000 crisis response toolkits. For these initial efforts, this Little Vermont Partnership has been recognized nationally with two different public service and community action awards. I should knock this thing over again real quick. <laughs> uh, I'm not a big award guy, but I am a big data guy. And the thing I'm most excited to share is this. Uh, new research released this morning by the University of North Carolina shows that overdoses in the U.S. are down 10.6% in 2024 and are down nearly 22% in Vermont. This shows me that what we're doing is working. Because of this recent data, our partnership will continue with our overdose prevention work and we'll have, <clears throat> we'll have an increased focus on mental health and suicide prevention. September is Suicide Prevention Month. And as such, we've been participating in suicide prevention discussions around the state, including the Suicide Prevention Symposium that was held at VTSU Randolph campus last week. It was an amazing event, and it was great to see so many people, professionals in the space, and lay people like myself, getting educated on suicide prevention and preparing themselves to be the hero in the face of a crisis. One of the most important things that I heard on Friday at the symposium was this. No one's ever doing great all the time, and no one is ever 100% all the time. <clears throat> we all have highs and lows, good days. Uh, <laughs> I'm struggling, I'm very sorry. We all have highs and lows, good days, weeks, months, and bad ones. This is okay. It's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to ask for help. Be there for the people around you. Know them as people. And be courageous enough to ask those people close to you, is everything okay? We've all lost someone to suicide. A close friend, a family member, or a loved one. Actively care for people around you, ask questions, and know where to turn if you need help. There are resources available. People to talk to, places to go, and num numbers, <clears throat> numbers to call if you're dealing with crisis. If you need someone to talk to, if you're dealing with crisis, 988 is the Suicide Crisis Lifeline and is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, via phone, text, or the internet. If you're interested in suicide prevention or overdose prevention resources, we can help you with those at wcwvt.com. Actively care for the people around you and know where to turn if you or someone you love needs help. And Mr. Governor, as I turn this back to you, I know that you have the occasion every once in a while to wear uh, a hard hat, and I'd like to present you with one of our um, mental health awareness hard hat stickers that I'm hoping you'll wear and, and kind of just help continue this conversation outside of um, just September. So thank you very much for having me, and thank stage you. is yours again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reed, and uh, appreciate all you're doing, uh, both in the military career, Army Ranger, and um, now he's retired military, but uh, 
still giving back, and we appreciate that. Thank you. With that, we'll open up to questions. Governor, and I don't know, maybe Commissioner Haas can uh, chime in, but in recent years in the legislature, uh, firearms policy and gun policy, waiting periods has also been a big piece of the mental health and suicide prevention puzzle. Have, are we seeing any difference in suicide rates or the data since some of these like waiting periods passed? I don't know. Um, whether we have any connection there or not. It, it's still hey, higher. Come on, than come on up. Introduce and introduce yourself, Chris. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Chris Allen, and I'm the director of suicide prevention. Uh, over the course of um, the past few years, we have not seen a decrease in firearm deaths um, it, for suicide specifically. We're still um, right around the national average of 54% or 55% um, of suicide deaths is by firearm. Other burning questions? I mean, I guess the other kind of, maybe this gets to the stigma um, kind of point of it, but like, you know, I imagine like veterans, Right? Or, or some of the people in the trades talking about mental health isn't always a priority or it's not always like, a, you know, it's, it's difficult for, for people to do. I mean, how do, you, how do you break that knot? How do you break this thing? There's probably a better question for, for Reeds uh, yeah. because... Hold on to those things. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't touch it. Yeah. <laughs> um, absolutely. So, um, uh, that everything that you just said is absolutely true. There is um, an in, in, I'll describe it as an intense um, negative stigma that surrounds kind of mental health in uh, the veteran community and in kind of the um, blue collar community, especially when we talk about males in both of those communities. Um, the way that we combat that is through things like this, continuing to have the conversation, ensuring that people know that there are resources out there available, there are people to talk to, there are places to turn. Um, if they are dealing with crisis, whether it's suicidal crisis or another, um, or they're just dealing with stress, any type of stress, um, it's important to continue to have these conversations so that people know there are places to turn and it's not just being talked about in September, it's being talked about all year round because these problems aren't just happening in September. They're happening all the time. We never know when crisis could affect us. So continuing to have the conversation so people know where to turn when it does affect them is one of the best things we can do. Thank you. Chris, did you want to add any of our initiatives that we have? Yeah, so uh, thank you, Reed, for highlighting that. And uh, also wanting to highlight a additional initiative that we have um, going on within Vermont, but also throughout the country um, and US territories. It's called the Governor's Challenge, um, which is to uh, reduce suicide amongst our um, service members, veterans, and families. Um, as we know that um, not only in Vermont, but also um, nationwide, they're at a uh, higher risk for suicide. Uh, and so uh, with this effort um, in Vermont, we have been uh, going around to all the emergency departments throughout the state and presenting a grand rounds presentation to ensure that uh, people in, uh, in the emergency department are uh, aware of this um, higher risk population um, and know how to uh, ask questions and be sensitive to their uh, to their culture and uh, and really uh, and also follow up with them uh, following uh, either uh, sharing that they have thoughts about of suicide or are struggling um, with other things that may lead to suicide as well. So um, that is an ongoing effort and um, it has been going on for about two years now. And we're really expanding that uh, as we head into 2025. There's a resource map that will be coming out um, in the next couple of months so that there's um, 
veteran and service member and family member specific resources that are publicly available and people will be able to uh, access that uh, resource um, by also filtering um, by their insurance, um, which we've heard is a barrier um, to access to care um, as TRICARE can be really challenging on the provider side. Semi-related, but a bit of a segue, I was just at the Joint Justice Oversight hearing this morning in the State House where um, correctional officers were testifying to legislators about the conditions at their workplace and their overtime and all of these things. Um, uh, what are you hearing as far as that goes? And a lot of these folks were saying that their mental health is really suffering as a result of their working conditions. Well, I'm sure it's, um it's difficult uh, to be an enforcement officer in within the corrections uh, system and uh, they see uh, some of the struggles people are going through so I'm sure the atmosphere itself is difficult uh, the working conditions are important uh, we've been trying to improve them throughout my two decades uh, in uh, whether it's within, in the Senate or in uh, as governor uh, we continue to try and improve the conditions and we have a long ways to go uh, admittedly um, but we've made improvements over the years and we'll continue to do whatever we can to, to make sure that they, the conditions are palatable uh, to, a, to a good working environment what are some of those changes um, over the years mm -hmm. um, just in doing whatever we can first of all uh, the workforce challenges they face um, the lack of uh, the number of people uh, within every sector throughout Vermont, uh, whether that's in the trades or whether that's in our prisons, whether it's in you know, law enforcement, we're all suffering uh, from a lack of workers. And that, so that results in, especially in corrections, um, more, more overtime hours, uh, increased worked hours, um, trying to do whatever we can uh, to, to make sure that we're, we're protecting the general public uh, and, and keeping people incarcerated. So it's, um, it's being aware of that, um, but also whether it's door locks, systems, all kind cameras, all kinds of things within the uh, correctional facilities, uh, and recently trying to do more uh, with the AC, uh, making sure we have an environment that's uh, conducive uh, to, for everyone. So. I don't know if I'm missing anything or whether you want to add anything or we want to, I don't know if Nick is on. If like. uh, I don't think Nick's on. I think he's testifying now. Yeah, so uh, everything the governor said is really highlights the significant focus that we've put on mental health um, for our correctional officers. In the last few years, uh, as the Department of um, Corrections has updated their strategic plan, the mental health um, for both those who are incarcerated and for their staff has been front and center, and you can see that reflected in their ongoing strategic plan. The governor highlighted uh, many of the efforts that we've undertaken to provide recruitment and retention in our facilities, hoping to working towards reducing overtime. In addition to that, they've ensured that they've got a peer support program that's in place for correctional officers. Um, it's accessible to anyone um, when they're experiencing challenges. It's also accessible when we have um, things happen in our correctional facilities. Um, we bring in that peer support program to make sure that there's wraparound services for the staff there. They've also most recently, to reflect their strategic plan, brought on an individual um, who is a part of the executive team that's focusing on the health and well-being of both the incarcerated population and for, and for their staff. Um, the Corrections Department has been participating for several years um, in a um, research project uh, at the Springfield facility to help them engage staff, uh, not only in just surveying to identify what the needs are, but also to identify what some specific strategies that the correctional officers there can identify to improve the mental health and well-being of staff. So it really is a focus and a priority um, for um, the department. Uh, the Department of Corrections has been participating heavily with the Department for Mental Health also to address the issue. Governor, as far as the workforce issue goes, I mean, how do you even break into that with it being such a statewide problem, but it seems so particularly acute in the corrections bill? I, I think it's acute everywhere. I, I might um, 
I'm not disagreeing that it's, it's difficult within that population just because that's 24-7, 365. Uh, that's what makes it so difficult. And, um, but, but I would say whether it's our um, Vermont State Police, um, VTRANS, uh, we have one district, the maintenance district, that has a 30% vacancy rate uh, within the district. So it's throughout the industry, throughout every sector. And the way we combat that is we need, first of all, more decent, affordable housing, uh, which is important to attract more people into the state. Uh, because as we've talked about a lot, our demographics are working against us. We're having more uh, retirees, uh, whether that be in corrections or whether that be in the maintenance districts or ESP. It seems like I'm always signing letters uh, recognizing years of service and that they're retiring. I sign more of them than I see people coming in. So it is, it's a difficult problem, um, and it's not that it's not solvable, but, um, but we know we have to make, we need more housing, we need to make it more affordable, and we can't keep taxing people out of the state. So it all has to work together in order to attract more people. One. Oh, sorry. I was just going to, one more, uh, one of the quotes from one of the correctional officers that really stood out to me, because, you know, Commissioner Dummel was testifying as well as the union, and this correctional officer said, uh, quote, if we could get VSCA and the state to come together instead of barking at each other, we'd probably get better solutions. I'm wondering what your response is to that. Well, we've, we've always tried to do whatever we can. I think uh, we've, uh, we've had some difficult negotiations over the years, but uh, that's the way things usually work. But I, I wouldn't say we're adversarial. Uh, I'm not saying we don't bark at the VSEA. Um, I know that they're representing uh, their uh, union members, and um, so they, they come to us and, and um, identify their grievances, and we try and do whatever we can to accommodate them. Governor, you, you mentioned housing, workforce, those were also key takeaways in a report from a consultant today uh, about our health care system, Act 127, that's the hospital sustainability conversation the Green Mountain Care Board has been, um, been looking at. One of the high level recommendations is rethinking what services our hospitals should be providing, uh, specifically our rural hospitals, and to move some of that care to primary care. I guess, what do you generally make of, of when you see hospital budgets continue to rise year over year, and should we be rethinking what services our hospitals are offering and where? Yeah, well, I'm sure it's a conversation we need to have, uh, again, with a somewhat stagnant population, an aging demographic, the usage is up. Um, nobody wants to, to lose their, their hospital. Um, they want to, to be viable It's part of their community. Um, not unlike our schools, and uh, and I think that where some of the challenges our healthcare system is facing, our schools are facing the same. So is there a connection there? And um, and some of the some of the remedies, uh, I believe, uh, will be similar as well. So we need to actively pursue that. Uh, we know that uh, working independently, hospitals can't provide everything to everyone. And I think there's a role to play in terms of consolidation um, and, and understanding that the regionalization and working together uh, to provide for our uh, citizens, but also understanding as a bottom line, we, we, can't, we can't afford everything. So we need to be smarter and we need to be more efficient in the way we uh, produce services in that same it holds true for, for schools as well. Anything you want to add to that? The consultant also, they talked about we're at a real tipping point where hospital budgets are spilling into commercial <coughs> insurance premiums, which are increasing. People are getting priced out of the market and foregoing care. These are longer term challenges that we're, they're solutions we're, we're talking about. What do you think can be done now or in the, the short term? Yeah, I think some. On the federal level, obviously, pharmaceuticals uh, is going to be important, and I know that uh, our congressional delegation is continuing to work on that. Uh, but um, 
but that's that's a big big piece of the puzzle as well. Uh, we've we've taken some steps in that uh, in that way over the years and uh, tried to to buy in Canada. Uh, we were one of I believe three states uh, who um, who ventured out there. Um, unfortunately, we haven't seen much from the fruits of our labor. I think I believe that uh, Florida may be moving forward with a, some sort of pilot pro project. But but again, uh, those are areas that I think. Uh, that would be viable and helpful uh, to cut down the cost of health care. Anything? Yeah. I think for the Act 167 report, you'll see a group of recommendations that the Green Mac Care Board uh, and the Agency of Human Services will take considerable action on. Um, as you saw in, those, in that, you saw highlighted um, improving workforce and housing as a critical feature. I think that there's a lot that we can do um, in that area. Um, Commissioner Haas said to me yesterday that one of the best recruitment pro programs that she has um, are coming into the state hospital as an example. Um, are there uh, workers who are coming in temporarily, many of whom want to stay in Vermont and can't. So I think that that's a primary issue. The governor highlighted to a couple of other areas that are in the report. Those include addressing hospital costs um, on it and looking at where we can um, look at efficiencies, look at changing the way that we deliver care. Um, some of those really are in the short term, but as you said, some of them are in the longer term as well. And then what wasn't highlighted there was really looking at and addressing some of our pharmacy costs was recently at a National Association for State Health Policy Leaders. Um, both hospital costs and pharmacy costs are at the, at the forefront. Um, and as the Green Mountain Care Board and others look at their regulatory authority, I think that that will come front and center. Uh, another, oh, well, another area of ripple effect uh, in terms of our health care system um, that has to do with where do people go? Um, and we're, we're trying to address this problem. We're, we're monitoring the situation. Uh, but when they're healthy enough to, to move away out of the hospital, but there's no place for them to go. There's no beds there. Um, and, and as we, again, our demographics, as we age, there's more people in that category. So they're left in the hospital uh, so that they, they aren't uh, on their own, uh, but that's costing more money as well. So we've been trying to address that as well. Yeah. So I think um, the Oliver Wyman report comes on the heels of sustainability work that the Agency of Human Services has been doing for a few years. Everything that you heard today around mental health, including 988, um, the mobile crisis, the alternatives emergency department, stabilizing the Brattleboro retreat, those have been a major focal point. The other piece that we've been working on is that we know that many of those who are boarding in our hospitals um, are there because they can't get care out outside. Um, it's not your typical um, uh, patient um, for long-term care. Um, the folks who are having the hardest time placing have mental health, um, substance use, they have behaviors that make it challenging um, in, a, in a typical uh, skilled nursing facility. And so on that front, we've been working really carefully um, uh, to put in place a facility, uh, a skilled nursing facility that's really focused um, and has the resources and the staffing to address those issues. Um, we are excited to see that come on uh, in Bennington um, in, the, in the coming months. Um, in that case, both the contract has been signed and the property has been purchased, and so we see that moving forward, but we will continue to work with the Bennington community um, as we transition forward with that. Again, in those skilled nursing facilities, staffing is, is critical. And to get more staffing, we need more people. To get more people, we need more housing. And to attract more people, we can't tax them out of considering Vermont. Um, Anything you want to add? Um, um, well, I, I'll add a, to in. the, OK. <laughs> so just as far as the skilled nursing facility question goes, um, from where I sit in the emergency department in Rutland, when UVM can't discharge their patients to skilled nursing facilities when they're ready to leave the hospital. It means that they're taking up beds. And what that means in our emergency department is that if you come into RED with a heart attack or a stroke or trauma that requires a tertiary hospital, a university hospital like UVM, 
I can't transfer you there. Even if you've received care there in the past, even if you have family that lives in Burlington, there isn't space at UVM for you to go. And so that means that we have to transfer you to New York or even Massachusetts. We've transferred people as far away as Connecticut before. And that's because there isn't space for them to stay because of the issues with boarding and emergency departments and the inability to discharge patients who are ready to leave. Thank you. With, for Secretary Samuelson and Governor Scott, um, with the deadline for some within the GA housing program coming up very shortly, uh, this morning there was probably anywhere between eight and 12 different city town municipal leaders in Montpelier City Hall saying they understand the history of the program and everything, but they'd say they just don't have the resources to help these people. They wish there would have been more state help, looking for more state help in the future, and that they just wish, whether it's on the legislative side or the executive side, there would have just been more done to help municipalities prepare for this. So I guess one, your response to that, and two, do we have any like kind of updated ballpark numbers of how many people we're looking at exiting tomorrow? I know some people may have found home situations, things like that, but just the general number of people that will be out. Well, again, I think that we've been trying to wean ourselves off the hotel motel program for a number of years now uh, with not a lot of success, and it's just not sustainable on a long-term basis. So um, it's a difficult situation. understand uh, the point of view of the municipalities as well, uh, but we don't have the resources either, uh, and so we're in the position we're at. Um, when we, as you remember, I think it was last spring uh, when uh, we um, we capped a number of people uh, in the GA program and we opened up emergency shelters uh, for instance and we didn't have too many uh, just a handful take advantage of that so the long-term approach is we're trying to establish more um, emergency shelters I think that that's part of the answer uh, but they're going to be you know more congregate settings Anything you want to add? I, I think that that's absolutely right. Um, it's a challenging situation for everyone involved, the clients that we serve, um, the towns and municipalities who have borne the brunt of the general assistance housing program, um, the workers who are on the front lines every day trying to help the individuals that, that we serve. Um, it's a, it's a no-win situation, but last year when the legislature um, took testimony, they did a really balanced approach to try to wean us off of the program to try to incrementally resize the program. We've had staff on the ground. Um, the majority of the individuals that we serve and that we're working with are connected to services in their local communities, mental health services, other services. Um, and historically at these moments, this isn't the first time, as the governor said, when, when we've seen these changes and we've set up shelters and other opportunities, we actually haven't seen um, folks avail themselves of that. In most communities last time, we're surprised not to see significant increases. First and foremost, I wanna emphasize though that much of our staff effort goes into helping people find housing. And the biggest issue that we have is that we simply don't have enough units. And so as we lo look at focusing forward, while we can't afford this program, what we really need to be focused on is, find, is building um, housing units that the individuals that we serve can afford and expanding that significantly. Commissioner Winters is on and can provide the specific numbers um, of those that were, will potentially be um, ineligible for the program today. Um, specifically related to ineligibility, uh, as a reminder to everyone, this year the legislature made two major changes. They put a cap on the program uh, that went into effect on the 15th, and they returned to having a day limit um, on the program, and it's 80 days, and that, that comes today. And so, Commissioner Winters, if you could provide the numbers for that, that would be great. Thank you, Secretary. Um, as you stated, a number of individuals in the program will come to the end of their 80 days of eligibility on Thursday, September 19th. It's a little difficult to predict how many people are, are constantly coming and going from the program, uh, but we estimate approximately 230 households on Thursday uh, would be at their 80 day limit. And then my last question with that is, um, Mayor Mike Dunn just out of Rutland specifically was throwing out some ideas. He said whether it's the local option tax or it's a 70-30 split now, making it maybe 90-10 so the municipalities can maybe use some of that money to help when situations like this come. 
or maybe using state grounds, state buildings that might kind of place of where you guys to the temporary shelters didn't quite have as many people show up. But I guess what do you make of the local option tax? Maybe moving that around as something municipalities can use. Well, again, I'm, I'm not in favor of raising any taxes. Uh, well, for the one. ones that already have it, switching yeah, tonight. Yeah, no, I, I understand. Um, I will say, you know, we've been working with Rutland in particular. Um, they, um, we thought we had a plan uh, for them, uh, some for emergency shelter, but uh, their provider uh, didn't follow through. They're, they're still working. They're they're st st okay, still working on that. Uh, we want to be able to assist them because they were one of the hardest hit during the hotel motel program days, and so we uh, we want to make sure that we're we're doing everything we can there. Um, we have. We set up an emergency shelter. Uh, we purchased the armory in Waterbury, uh, but through legislative action, we're not able to use that at this point in time. So we'll um, we'll continue to keep that on the back burner and see what we can do. Uh, but but I think again, these congregate emergency shelters are something that we're going to have to do more of. Um, but also uh, that um, housing across the, the board. Is what we need. Uh, we have a crisis in housing in Vermont, and I've said this multiple times. Um, if it's a true crisis, as many has have identified it as, um, we need to treat it as such. And sometimes we have to do some things that are uncomfortable. Um, regulation, regulatory reform. I was disappointed we didn't go far enough with in, during the legislative session, um, but we're going to go back at it uh, if uh, if I'm successful in November and. And we get some some uh, balanced approach with some legislators who understand the crisis is here, and then we have to do something about it. Um, hopefully, we'll we'll be able to make some gains because, again, no matter what sector we're providing housing for, um, it helps the overall cause because we need it in both emergency shelters, low-income housing, middle-income housing, and. Um, just to satisfy the workforce. Governor, during the pandemic, when we had all of the money for the GA program, there were some lawmakers at the time who had said, we're taking solid steps to eradicating homelessness here in Vermont. You know, here we are three, four years later. I guess just like maybe philosophically, big picture, like what do you see the role of government being in, in tackling homelessness? Well, again, I would say, I would say uh, that we haven't addressed the, the, the situation with a housing crisis appropriately. Uh, we, should have, we should have seen it coming. In fact, we identified it, uh, but, um, but we didn't take steps quick enough uh, to counteract that. So I think some of that, and of course, with uh, inflation the way it is, a lack of any housing available to people. Um, regardless of price, is uh, has been a challenge. Uh, could we just go back to the the idea from municipal leaders to open up state buildings and state lands for shelter and camping? What do you make of that? Well, again, I, yeah, I don't know about state land for camping. Um, you know, we've seen uh, what happens in that, those situations. We'd rather have more congregate emergency shelters. Uh, whether it's um, if, if we have property available, we would consider it, uh, but that would take legislative action as well. So everything's on the table, but, um, but we need to have a discussion about it because you, you can't just wave a magic wand and make it so. And I don't know what buildings um, they're referring to, uh, but, uh, but I don't know as we have in an order, order uh, amount of housing or um, buildings available for that purpose. And they'd have to be re repurposed as well. It's not as though you have a building and you're able to, to put people in there to live in uh, without all the amenities that go along with it. So it's, uh, it's not as simple as just opening the doors. Um, Governor, uh, local social media, very different subject. Local social media is talking about a supposed minor attracted persons gathering this weekend in Washington County. And the state police say, told me this morning, uh, they are, quote, working to understand what this event might entail. That was around 10 o'clock. 
Uh, do you or Commissioner Morrison have any new information to add on this? Um, I'm not aware of, of I, I'm not on social media a whole lot, so I haven't seen that, and I have no idea what that is about. But I see our Deputy Commissioner is on. Commissioner Batesy. Good afternoon, uh, Dan Batesy, Deputy Commissioner for Public Safety. Uh, we, uh, the Vermont State Police is aware of those reports. We are investigating uh, what are conflicting reports on this, by the way. Um, and uh, the challenge, of course, is um, that no laws have been broken. Uh, we are uh, prepared, if there are allegations of, of laws being broken, to investigate and, and respond. But we also want to be sure to protect uh, First Amendment rights, uh, regardless of how distasteful those opinions might be. So uh, I think what we're doing is gathering information. The Vermont Intelligence Center is uh, uh, fully involved, looking at all the open sources and trying to uh, uh, understand uh, better what uh, what's going on. Um, and uh, we'll be prepared to, to protect safety of all, uh, all citizens. Thank you. Um, sir, with the mail-in ballots uh, going out soon, just how do you feel about those and what impact do you think they'll have on this election, especially relative to recent elections? Yeah, I've been an advocate for mail-in ballots, uh, and I've been trying to uh, talk with the legislature uh, about increasing uh, the number of, of ballots uh, in other elections as well. I think that's important. We saw in this uh, this recent primary a 15 percent uh, rate of uh, participation, which isn't good enough. So I think we have to do whatever we can uh, to increase participation, and I believe that mail-in ballots are important in doing so. So we'll see uh, how that, I guess we'll We'll be able to tell by the end of the the election uh, how well that was received and whether that uh, was enough to to turn the tide. Now that election day is sort of election season, you know, it's ballots are in hand, but campaigning continues. How has that changed the way that either you campaign, or I know that you've been out with several um, House and Senate uh, candidates as well, campaigning with them. How has that changed or just shifted how politics works? I think it just opens up uh, election day for you know a month, so you have to treat it as such. When the ballots are mailed and they're in in the mailboxes of uh, constituents, uh, you better make sure your message gets gets across and that uh, you get them to utilize them and, and vote appropriately. Probably going to ask you this every week until November. Have you made your decision? I can't wait on... for November. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can answer the question though yeah, without on you the asking. Presidential God, contest. That one. Yeah. yeah, that one. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, as I've said, uh, and I'll keep repeating, uh, I am not going to be voting for the former president, President Trump. Um, but uh, but I have not made up my mind at this point in time who I'm going to be voting for. Would you do a like a write-in candidate if not for VP Harris? Um, possibly. I, I don't know. I haven't made up my mind at, at this point in time, but I will. Okay. So. Any uh, update with flooding, FEMA, um, how things are going? Um, you, you know, sometimes we forget when we're in areas that. Uh, uh, that were not hit. I mean, some of the viewers uh, didn't didn't experience the flooding, um, but it's still a very real issue. When you go to Red Village Road in Lindenville, or Brook Road in Lindenville, or Brook Road in Plainfield, it's still very, very much front and center. So, we're uh, we're making some gains, uh, but not all the roads are open back up at this point in time. Not all the bridges have been even temporarily replaced. Uh, so this is a, an issue that we're we're continuing uh, to make sure that we we uh, are behind and uh, making sure that we get the roads open back up before the next uh, next season is upon us. I see our chief recovery officer Doug Farnham is on. Doug, do you want to add anything? Yes, Governor. I would add that um, you know Vermonters are they are engaging with FEMA. FEMA has distributed over four million of individual assistance for this summer's floods, 
and uh, based on our initial estimates, we expect um, at least several million dollars more. So I want to encourage Vermonters to continue to approach FEMA. If you do get a FEMA denial of benefits, make sure that you understand what they're saying there. Make sure, I, would, I would encourage people to re-engage with FEMA to try to increase your award, to give them more details. <clears throat> Sorry. Last year, we saw hundreds, if not thousands, of households that received additional funds after they went back to FEMA with more information. So don't give up when you um, when you get if you get an award that is less than you believe it should be. Please push back. We do have state bridge case managers who are working with the long-term recovery groups. There are 11 long-term recovery groups around the state. Uh, in the Richmond area, that one is just forming up, so they don't have a lot of infrastructure yet, but they're just pulling together. And I would say. Uh, go work with the long-term recovery group in your area. If you're if you're not seeing the progress, not seeing the support you want, those long-term recovery groups, uh, the state is connecting with them, and they're the best place for individuals. Just have someone to, to keep them on track and try to make sure that they're getting the support that they should get. Um, and not only would they help you understand issues with FEMA, but other potential funding sources. That's really a great place to connect with resources. So. Please don't accept that first letter from FEMA. Please continue to push back. Try to increase your award. And um, we did see, like as I said, hundreds if not thousands of people last year that got more money by going back to FEMA and clarifying and saying, no, really, this is broken and I need help fixing it. We're also, I think, uh, 12 or 13 days away from a government shutdown. Is Could that potentially affect FEMA the money that municipalities will get, any, any feeling on that? Well, again, it's like a, it seems like a, we've, we haven't been through this uh, probably in the last six months, but it, it seems like a perennial issue. Uh, there is the threat of a government shutdown, um, but we always manage to get through it, and I have faith that Congress will take action. Uh, in terms of FEMA, um, it is uh, having an effect on some of the dollars flowing through. They, they don't have unlimited resources. Uh, they're taking care of individual needs first, uh, as they should, and then, uh, and then hopefully reimbursing for other costs associated with, with the flooding and the declaration. So it's affecting us somewhat. but. Uh, but again, I'm hoping, I know our congressional delegation is advocating for a replenishing that fund uh, in the short term, even if with a continuing resolution. So uh, we're hopeful that they will prevail. Anything you want to add, Doug? Um, Governor, just to say, yes, there there is money in the disaster relief fund for the individuals so vermonters the individuals their ch assistance will not change it will continue to flow the primary impact of the budget delays and the continuing resolution is on the municipalities but um immediate needs funding has been instituted like the governor said this is a familiar uh dynamic it's been instituted um somewhere between eight and ten times in the last 20 years and it has never affected the long-term reimbursement that municipalities receive. If we received a declaration and the percentage uh, of assistance is going to be 75%, for example, for this year, I think it may impact exactly when that check comes through, um, but it will not impact at the end of the day how much money those municipalities receive in their rebuilding efforts. All right, we'll go to the phones. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. I think we wore Tom out. All right, we'll go back to the room. Um, back to healthcare, really quick. What do you or Commissioner Samuelson make of the Green Mountain Care Board's um, cap on hospital revenues and um, charges from earlier this week? We haven't. I haven't spoken to you about that, but uh, maybe you have some thoughts. I think the Green Mountain Care Board uh, has moved forward uh, this year uh, with careful consideration. Um, we haven't had a chance to fully evaluate the impact of their decisions, um, but at this point, uh, we are seeing them really work hard 
uh, to try to address the affordability issues here in Vermont. My last follow-up, a big um, recommendation with moving forward with payment reform, global budgets, captive payments, is, is healthcare reform paying off at, at this point? I mean, we're, I forget how many years into all payer, but how, yeah. how is that holding up, do you think? Yeah, so we've uh, we've learned a lot over the last um, seven years under the all payer model and under reforms uh, previous to that. I think as we look at the Oliver Wyman report uh, that is coming out and assess what the recommendations are there, um, it demonstrates that there is a lot more uh, yet to do, um, and that we need to pivot in, in some some areas. So we're going to scour through the Oliver Wyman report. Uh, with a sense of urgency um, to implement the recommendations. Uh, the affordability issues caused by health care in Vermont are real. Um, and so we need to work together with the Green Mountain Care Board, uh, with the rest of state government, uh, and with local communities in particular to address um, the affordability issues. Again, I think we've learned a lot. Some things have worked really well. Um, some things we know uh, it's time to, to move on from. Hi, Emily Haas again, Commissioner at the Department of Mental Health. I just wanted to um, just say out loud that we've covered a lot of heavy stuff today. Um, and so I want to reiterate that if you're listening or participating in this particular uh, press conference and you do feel um, you know, anxious or are impacted by some of the conversations that we've had today, uh, to make sure that folks are reaching out to 988, uh, checking in with yourself, your neighbors, um, and your community. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, folks are keeping that in mind as we cover this really tough stuff. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it.